Bonjour. My French will stop there because I don't want to insult anyone. As you can tell, I'm not French, I'm English. My name is Steve Rackham from the UK. I work for NetApp and I'm the CTO for financial services. What I want to talk to you today is about regulation. I know this is an AI conference, so the question might be why are we talking regulation at an AI conference? Well, financial services is arguably the most regulated industry in the world. The big regulation everyone's been talking about and everyone has been getting ready for is DORA. But the next big regulation that's going to really impact financial services is the EU AI Act. How are companies in financial services looking at using AI? How are they looking to use it responsibly, ethically, in the right way, and making sure their customers trust what they're doing? So I'm going to cover a couple of things today. Why do we need this? Why is this important? Why do we need a regulation around AI? What is the EU AI Act? Just very quickly, if you're not aware of what it is, how do we approach AI? What are they doing within the Act to actually look at how they respond, how they govern it? What are some of the articles and the requirements? Because that's when you start to get challenges. What do you, as a financial service organization, need to do to make sure that you adhere to a regulation? And then just closing, putting it all together. So why do we need this? Why is a regulation important? Well, if we take a step back and think about financial services, financial services in itself is built on one big thing, which is trust. At NetApp, we did a survey of financial service customers. So not banks, not insurance companies, but the customers of those organizations. And we asked a number of questions. Things like, do you use a mobile application? Do you use your branch still? That sort of thing. We asked it across different countries, different age groups, and there were only two questions that were consistent, regardless of the age, regardless of the country. Do you trust your financial institution with your money? Of which 98% people said yes, which is good. The other one was, do you trust your financial organization with your data? Only 66% of people trust their financial institution with their data. And if you think financial institutions have more data than most other organizations on their customers, and they don't trust it. And we all know AI absolutely needs data to be able to run. And the problem you get is data is everywhere. How do you manage, how do you ensure that data is safe in an AI world when it is absolutely everywhere? But it's siloed. It has bottlenecks. And it's constantly under threat. We all hear about cyber attacks and cyber threats and malware and ransomware. Ultimately, what these people and organizations are trying to do is get to your data. So the EU AI Act starts to look at regulating that. How do you make sure that your data and the AI you use is safe, transparent, traceable, non-discriminatory, which is an interesting one, and environmentally friendly? These are the different key things that the EU are looking at around AI. They want to ensure that wherever you use AI, however you use AI, you are making sure that it's safe. Interesting, another step from a different organization, we didn't run this, run this one, is that 61% of Europeans think that AI robots in financial services is good. They think that's a good thing. The big concern is, they are concerned about the technologies used. They want to ensure that if you're using AI to provide services, if you're using AI to make decisions, it is managed correctly. The data that you hold, all of that data as a financial institution, you are using it correctly. You are making sure that it's safe. So people are happy for, on the whole, are happy for AI to be used, but you have to make sure that you're controlling that data well. How do we approach it? How have the EU defined what they're going to do? They've taken this model. I don't know if anyone's aware of it. They classify AI into four big areas. Unacceptable risk, high risk, limited risk, and minimal risk. Now, the bottom two I'm not going to cover too much today. Unacceptable risk are things that they just outright say you cannot do. 
you are not allowed to do certain processes, you're not allowed to do certain jobs with AI, and I'll touch upon a couple in a minute. High risk is the one where you start to see a lot more in financial services. There can be a lot of high risk environments, a lot of high risk use cases. And what they're concerned about there is negatively affecting the safety or fundamental rights of customers. And they're divided in two main categories. EU product safety and AI systems falling into specific areas. Unacceptable risk means a threat to safety, where people are concerned or where they're concerned about a threat to people and the safety. About things like social scoring or dangerous behavior, encouraging dangerous behavior. A social scoring one, people start to question, would you really do social scoring? Would you do real-time and remote biometrics? Or would you do behavioral manipulation? In the UK, not in financial services, but in the UK, a major train company actually partnered with Amazon. What they were doing was they were using CCTV cameras on the trains as people were getting their daily commute into the office. And they were looking at people and using AI, they were doing sentiment analysis on how people were reacting. What were people's moods? What were they doing? How did they feel or how did it think they felt? That information was then passed through to Amazon and Amazon would target them with certain types of products that they thought they might like to buy. Now, that's quite a scary concept, being able to look at people. Imagine the CCTV rooms in this room, sitting watching you, walking around here, and then targeting you on your way home based on what you've done today. From the EU AI Act, that's not allowed. That's classed as unacceptable risk. It's making sure that you don't start using AI from a behavioral manipulation point of view. So it's really quite important looking at what you can and what you can't do and understanding where AI fits and where it doesn't. From a high risk point of view, this is where financial services starts to fit more. There's lots of different organizations, lots of different verticals. But I think financial services falls under a couple of things. One is the critical infrastructures that could put life and health of citizens at risk. So in the UK, there's a, a, a company that provides 25% of the country's pensions. That is classed as critical infrastructure. That system, those systems, that company cannot go down. The government has defined that as being critical because if people are unable to get to things like their pensions, then they don't have the money, and it has an impact on human life. The other one is essential private and public services. How do you ensure that people still get paid? How do you ensure that people can still make their mortgage payments, they can get loans, all this sort of thing? So you'll see AI being defined, a lot of AI use cases for financial services, being defined under the high risk category. And this is where certain requirements are then called upon. Organizations need to look at what they're doing, how they're protecting the AI systems, the data involved, who has access. And that's some of the things I'll touch on in a bit. So what are some of the articles and their requirements? This is where what we've done is we've looked at the act looked at where data is key, and then trying to work where we can help organizations to meet some of the requirements. Now, no organization will be able to say, we can make you compliant with the regulation. No organization should be saying that. But what we can do is look at the act, look at the multiple articles there are, and say, in this area, this is where we believe we can help you achieve compliance. We can help you on your journey to compliance. So what we've done is we've broken it down and we've pulled out some key articles. Yes, these are actual articles. They are an extremely boring read if you really struggle for sleep. It's a great way. Take the act, go through it. There's no pictures. It gets very dull very quickly. But there's some key things in there. And we pulled out a, a few of the articles. So article 12 talks about record keeping. You think AI, artificial intelligence, why is that important? What they want is they're worried about how high-risk AI systems shall allow, technically allow automatic recording of logs. Why is that important? Well, if you've got an AI system making decisions, you might need to prove how and why that decision was made. You need to ensure traceability within that decision process, within that AI model. And if it's a human making that, that it's a lot easier to get that traceability because it's someone you can speak to. If it's an AI solution, it's making the decisions in a black box. 
how can you ensure that decision was right? So you need to check a reference database. You need to look at the data that's being used. And also, any identification of people. So from a NetApp perspective, we do a number of things where we can help organizations with this. One of the things is, if someone's trying to get into your system, they were trying to change the logs. Because if they can hack and get into your system and influence your AI environment, they need to get rid of their traces. But the other thing is, if you're making a decision, if your AI solution is making a decision, the regulate, regulators and auditors may well come back in three, five, ten years' time and say, you decided to give that person a loan. Why did your AI solution give that person a loan then? So you need to ensure that when you make decisions, when you're training models, when you're implementing new AI solutions, that you have logs that you can absolutely secure, put a fingerprint against to make sure you know what was happening, why it was happening, how it was happening. You need to be able to make sure that nobody can change that. Because if someone has got into your system, how do you make sure that these copies of your data, but importantly, the logs to prove what you did, why you did it, and when you did it, are not changed? You also, when we're talking large amounts of data, because we are, AI uses petabytes and petabytes of data. You need to be able to be in a situation to recover that data should something happen, whether that be a nefarious actor and someone's purposefully attacked that system, or whether it's because there's been an issue and the data's been removed. You need to be able to recover that data extremely quickly. So what we do is give you that ability to make sure that data is locked, make sure the logs are locked, but also recover those logs, recover that data regardless of that size in seconds. And you automate that process. So that it's not something that you have to keep doing daily yourself. It's automated in the system. We look at transparency and provision of information to users. So making sure that when you design an AI solution, you're designing it with transparency in mind. People need to be confident. Going back to that trust thing I talked about at the start. Your customers who are using the AI solutions that you create need to have trust in you, in your solutions. So there needs to be a sufficient level of transparency to be able to interpret what's going on. What we do there is a number of things. We look at how the data and what data you're actually using. As we know, and as I said earlier, financial, financial institutions have rafts of data. How do you ensure that when you're looking to build your AI models, you're using the right data and data that's allowed to be used. Because again, we all know that some data can and some data can't be used. How do you make sure the right data is being used? How do you make sure the models that you're training are using relevant data? You need to ensure that the right data is being used. So we have ability to look at the data you're, you're holding, scan that data, decide based on either things that we've defined or you can define your own parameters, and say, this is type of data, this is personal information data or this is banking data, or this is just someone's user's home directory on our system, and decide what you're going to do with that data. Are you going to use that in your AI training models? Also, who has access to that data? Again, you can't give access to that data ev to everybody. Ensuring that that data is, used, is used by the right people at the right place at the right time is absolutely key. So you can define who is able to use this data, who's got access to the data. Again, helping that trust with your customers. Human oversight. It talks about high-risk solutions should be designed and developed in a way, including appropriate human-machine interface tools. So not everything is being left to machines. There has to be a level of human oversight on this. You can't just create a solution, stand it up, push it out, and let it run on its own. There has to be some way that, machines, that humans can still be involved in this process. Can, they can check what's going on. They can make sure they fully understand the solution that's deployed. Looking for anomalies, looking for dysfunctions, unexpected performance, that sort of thing. And that ability to stop. If something is detected that's wrong, if there seems to be a problem, that ability to say, no more. We will stop now and investigate. 
the clicker is very sensitive. So one of the things we do is looking at the users on your system. There are lots of different users constantly accessing data, constantly building AI models, or using the data for other means. One of the things we do is we build profiles of who, on this, who is on the system. What are they doing? What are they accessing? We know this data scientist is always coming in at a certain time, accessing this data, doing this sort of work, always in at the same time. We'll build a profile and say, right, we now know that that user acts in that way. If for some reason they start accessing things they shouldn't, if for suddenly they start coming in earlier or later and doing things that aren't normal, we have the ability to then recognize and flag that person as a potential risk. What that means is, is if someone is accessing the data, starting to do something they shouldn't do because they've been hacked or because they're deciding to maliciously do something, you can put in protection around the data to make sure that that data doesn't get corrupted. That ability to then say that user now needs to ask for more permission before they access data. That user can no longer access data. Automatically put a stop button in. The other thing we see, especially if a system is being attacked, and the thing that the AI Act is concerned about is cyber attacks. So it talks about what do you do around that? One of the things we look at is encryption monitoring. Now, all systems encrypt data in some way at some level. Not all of the data, but there is always some level of encryption. If there is a cyber attack, one of the first things they look to do is encrypt data. Because we hold the data, because we are custodians of that data for you, what we're able to do is monitor how much encryption is going on. And if we see that start to rise because there's been an attack, again, we can put in place procedures, we can play, put in place automatic tools to stop that happening further, to lock down the system, lock down the data, ensure nothing else is encrypted, alert where necessary, to make sure that something isn't running away within the system. Because there's a big concern that people will access and influence the data. Data poisoning. And that's where, again, the EU is really concerned. It's about accuracy and robustness, cybersecurity, technical redundancy, because again, if your systems are using AI, and that is fundamental, they appreciate that that's key for you. But the customers you're serving absolutely need to be put first. If they can no longer access services because of a cyber attack, then that is a big concern. So how do you make through sure through technical redundancy that those systems, those AI models, will continue to run regardless? How do you have backup or fail-safe plans in place? And stop third parties, unauthorized third parties, from poisoning the data. And it's a question, do you, could data really be poisoned, and what is the impact? Now, there we, I don't know if anyone's aware of the Google AI and cheese example. It's where Google accidentally poisoned the data. They built their AI model. They built their AI assistant. And if you go online and search for Google AI, how do I make cheese? People are asking random questions of Google AI because it's the new thing. And someone said, how do you make cheese? And one of the ingredients, according to Google AI, is glue. And it's because the source data they use for training, they didn't check it. They didn't verify it. And some of it they used was looking at what do you, how do you make cheese in the film industry? If you're filming something, how do you make something look realistic? You add glue to it because it's stringy. Because they didn't check the source data they used for training, that data was poisoned and infected. Now, not on purpose, but that's the concern. If you think in financial services, if you can influence and poison that data during training so that when an AI solution goes live, that may never be seen or not seen for years. And the impact is very scary. So, and that's the, the data poisoning. So again, we try and help organizations manage this. We have different levels of protection, different ways of helping organizations manage and protect their data whether it be looking at encryption blocking, making sure that if there's things going on in the system it shouldn't be, stopping that instantly. We look at things like multi-admin verification. 
The easy way to describe that, I always think of it as built for me because making sure I don't do something stupid. The easy way to describe it are the keys on a nuclear submarine. You need two keys to switch. So in this instance, you need two administrators to approve if someone is asking for more data, if someone is trying to do something different. User behavior analytics we've already talked about. At the application layer, is making sure that the applications are secure by design. Making sure that the applications are not given access to anyone anywhere. And then you move up the stack around the network and the user endpoint. But ultimately, from our perspective, we look at how we protect the data, because that is what people are trying to get to, whether that be to steal, whether that be to hold to ransom, or whether that be from a poisoning perspective, to influence what you're going to do. So as I said, we've got more to admin verification overview. That ability to say, OK, this user is now accessing or requesting to access data they'd never access. Making sure that then two people need to give them access to that. End-to-end -end encryption, again, it talks about making sure that data is safe regardless of where it is, and encrypting data through transportation, through using it, and then when you lock it down because you need to save it for regulators for five years' time, making sure that data is encrypted. But also malicious file blocking. So again, when someone tries to attack a system, they'll typically put a, some kind of feeder file on a system that will kickstart the malware process. We, in the industry, People know what these kind of files generally are. New ones are coming out all the time. But generally, we know what these files are. So what we'll do is we'll make sure that anyone that tries to automatically put these files on, we can say that's not allowed and stop them straight away and then alert to try to stop any attack before it happens. So we look to protect your data from the ground up. <clears throat> So putting it all together, we look at providing you a solution, working with the likes of NVIDIA, creating an AI stack that you can then work on to create your AI solutions, to run your intensive workloads and training models, and to run your solutions. But that's just the bit that everyone expects. Everyone understands AI needs to be fast, powerful, lots of data. What we then do is provide you that ability to create tamper-proof logs tamper-proof systems, making sure that data is locked away. Creating a logical air gap. Again, the Act talks about creating an air gap for the system to make sure that if something happens, you've got a different area with your data and a different environment that you can then look to recover from. You can make sure and check if there are any problems. We can then move that and copy that data to a, a second site, a separate environment. Because it's all well and good creating a logical air gap if it's in the same system. But if that, something happens to that system, your AI models go down regardless. You need to recover. So we can take that data and replicate it into a different area very easily. You can then potentially do forensic examination because either you've been attacked or because the regulators have said, why have you done this? Taking a copy of your data, moving it to a safe environment, and being able to examine that to understand what's happened, why it's happened, what decisions were made. And then we have different things that come into play, whether it be user behavior analytics, like I said, ransomware protection, multi-admin verification, all of these different types of parts of the solution to make sure that that data you're using is safe, secure, and help you to meet the EU AI Act. Two big things I've highlighted there are reporting and API calls. A lot of those things are on-box things, the things that we do within our environment. What we also do, because we understand we are not the only person in your ecosystem, we can report out the EU AI Act gain cause about reporting. We can help report on your system out to different environments you use. We can also integrate from an API core to automate things, to make things easier with other systems that you have in place. So what we look to do is we look to protect your data we look to ensure that it's always available for your AI solutions. But then we also look to make sure we can help meet the AI reg or help you meet the AI regulations around use of AI in high risk environments by building a solution that encompasses data wherever it sits, whether it be in the cloud or on prem, because again, we see a lot of people using the cloud for AI now, and bringing these parts of the solution regardless where you are.
So on that, thank you very much. <laughs>